let's begin tonight with uh, certainly a little perspective. And I want to welcome you to the second Cronkite PR Lab uh, mentorship lecture, and it's inspired by its namesake, Enid R. Pansky. The Cronkite PR Lab's Enid R. Pansky mentorship series honors the entrepreneurial spirit of Scott Pansky's mother and her role as mentor to many. A year ago, Scott, who is the co-founder of the international PR firm Allison & Partners, he funded a new program at the Cronkite School, and it was designed to connect a nationally recognized practitioner with an aspiring public relations student, and that is the reason why it is called the Aspire Award. So the program's intention is to create an opportunity for a senior level public relations student to spend quality time with a top tier professional that they wish to emulate. Tonight I want to offer a special welcome not only to our guests, our wonderful speaker, mentor, Gail Adams Jackson, our Aspire Award recipient, Torrance Sinclair, her family, Louis Pansky, and also Samantha Pansky, who prefers to be known as Sam. But we welcome you all. And in the spirit of mentorship and collegiality, let's start by asking, let's start by starting. Let's see if we can get this to go. In just a moment. Gives you an opportunity to really enjoy the artwork that Linda Davis does for us so beautifully. And we'll want to flip that. And there we go. So when we talk about inspiration, who is a mentor? Well, a mentor can be a he or a she, a trusted friend, a teacher, an advisor, a counselor on the career path or the road of life, and a protege. They seek the guidance of that wise counselor to help them navigate the sometimes tricky terrain of the workplace. Last year, we launched the event celebrating mentorship with PR icon an author of probably a book most PR students have read and practitioners certainly, Effective Public Relations. And Dr. Glenn Broom, who is the pride of San Diego State University, was Scott Pansky's academic mentor. Danielle Chavez was selected as the inaugural protege. So what is Danielle doing today? Danielle is currently working full time on Greg Abbott's campaign for Texas governor. So our speaker, uh, keynote speaker, Gail, knows something about working with governors. She's worked with all 50 of them at some point or another in her career. We'll hear more about that. I want to know what she has to say about some of them. Yeah. And it seems faded. Perhaps it was the alignment of the recent moon, sun, and earth that resulted in tonight's event happening exactly one year later on the same date, April 17th. How did that occur? I double checked that to make sure I wasn't wrong. But this year's mentor, again, who is inspirational, is our wonderful guest, award-winning communicator, Gail Adams Jackson, and our Aspire Award recipient, Torrance Sinclair. And it's important to note that it's Gail's character and career that Torin aspires to emulate, very important. But a question remains. We have a mentor who inspired the founder of our mentorship feast, the co-founder of Allison and Partners, and that would be Mr. Scott Pansky. Who instilled in him daring dreams vision. Who inspired him to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and become more? As you might have guessed, 
His original mentor, his personal mentor, was Enid Ruth Pansky. Scott would like to take a few moments and share why mentoring meant so much to his mother. Scott, will you join me? Thank you, Fran. I appreciate that. Uh, before I actually talk about that, I do want to just say that you are all very lucky to have Fran as a mentor and what she does here with you in this program. This mentorship program wouldn't have happened if it weren't for her and kind of what she showed me about what the potential of the PR lab was here at Arizona State. Uh, I came and I took a tour and uh, just like we did today, I saw a few projects and was really inspired by what you as students are doing. And as I came up and I did my PowerPoint presentation, I felt very antiquated as uh, you guys have uh, much better capabilities than what I have. So anyhow, thank you for having me. And uh, you know, we're proud at Allison and Partners as we're able to you know, look at ASU grads and, and make a few hires here and there. So I did want to introduce, I have a couple of staffers here that I want to talk about. Uh, Jessica Peraza over here on the left. She's a grad for, what, two years ago now? year ago, uh, came to us as an intern and today was promoted to an assistant account executive. So congratulations. And then uh, some of you may know uh, Christy Poole. Christy, stand up or wave, do something. Uh, as an intern at Allison & Partners, I'm very proud to say that today she was hired as an account coordinator. So, congratulations. And uh, Fran mentioned earlier, my dad is here and my uh, oldest daughter is here who's been touring the campus and hopefully will uh, maybe be a, a sun devil someday. So we'll see. So um, talk about my mom. I told Fran I was going to be unscripted uh, for this because I just wanted to en enjoy the moment. Uh, my mom passed away uh, about two years ago and that she was a woman that was very strong, strong personality, loved to tell stories. I'm sure I got storytelling from her. But what I would always remember is long car trips. You know, we'd go from one place to another where she worked. My mom was a Tupperware dealer, moved on to become a manager, and actually became a distributor. And we would have these long car talks, and she would share to me values, ethics. We would have conversations, life and death. We'd talk about work. And it was just really good quality time that we don't get nowadays. Because most of you have one of these and you spend half your time talking to somebody and the other half your time looking at this while you're talking to somebody. And when I take my kids to school, like my mom did with me, I didn't have a phone, but I have to tell my kids, turn your phones off, put them down. It's time to have just car talk and have some quality time. And that was memories that'll stay with me forever. And then when it came to work, this is a woman who was a pioneer within the industry of Tupperware and motivated thousands of women to get a job. And you know, most of the folks that enter into the PR world are women. You far surpass the numbers of us guys going into this industry. But there had to be people who set the stage for you who opened the doors to show that you could have a career and not be a housewife or do something that was expected. And my mom started her career when I was young, and I remember being jealous because I thought her career was more important than me. But at the end of the day, she was an inspiration to thousands and thousands of women, some who became di distributors down the line, but these were all women who owned their own companies who own their own businesses. And when she passed away, Fran and I were already talking about a mentorship program in general because I think this experience that you're going through is very important. But I did want to you know, put a cap on it and say, you know, this is something I think my mom would have enjoyed. And when she passed away, my dad had an idea. And he had us go out and we bought wristbands and it says, what would Enid say? And uh, she was always very positive. And I think the one thing I leave you with today is you look at your careers and you look at wonderful mentors like Gail and you look at yourselves as growing leaders, you know, touring what you've accomplished and to be here today in its own right is very, very successful. But my mom was always positive, always positive. 
And if that's the one thing I can leave with you in your careers and when you work with people, when you're positive, people around you are positive. So have fun tonight. You're gonna have a great presentation. Congratulations to both of you and thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of this. So I am going to spend a little bit of time uh, telling you about Torrance and Claire. I'm gonna put the slide back up for our evening. And Torrin is a unique individual. First of all, her name uh, alone, I have to ask her about, where does that come from? Uh, it's not something that I've heard before, but, but maybe that makes her different, that makes her unique, and that's something to be embraced. So during the time that she's been at the Cronkite School, she has kind of been the integrated public relations practitioner without even realizing it. She started off in journalism very much like our mentor tonight. Uh, Gail uh, started off as a broadcast journalism. So print was actually Torrance avocation, and then she morphed into the public relations side. She was an editorial assistant at AZ Big Media, a, a PR intern at the Hurt Museum, at the Musical Instrument Museum. She has worked with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. She has interacted with press on a regular basis. She's been a key strategist in terms of social media, and some of her colleagues have joined us here tonight who just by strange coincidence, have also been members of the PR lab. How did we work that out? Uh, but we are delighted that uh, they are here to support her. She's also worked as a communications director for the Downtown Devil, founding PR director for the Barrett Choir. What is so unusual is I didn't realize Barrett had a choir, but... Now I know because as PR director for the choir, she played an integral role in recruiting members and their engagement with their audience increased by 70%. She's placed articles in the state press, certainly worked on promotions at ASU events. She's been an RA, she shares that with Scott, who also, as I understand, was an RA when he was in college. So he has an appreciation for the kind of hours she keeps, not only in the lab, but through RA activities. So she is also responsible for kind of an all-night uh, soiree over in Taylor Place a couple months ago when the Today Show showed up out of the blue, and we had Al Roker, who was, um, you know, masquerading as Sparky. How many times does that happen? Uh, all of that was as a result of uh, a social media uh, connection, as it were. So she has uh, effectively uh, used that skill not only in the, the Today Show medium, but also for Politico, PBS's Music Makers, uh, 12 News Today, the Arizona Republic, Phoenix Business Journal, and if that weren't enough, she has been recently selected uh, along with another PR Lab member to participate in the McCain Institute's Sedona Forum that will happen uh, in the next few days. So we certainly are appreciative of the work that she puts into everything she does. And uh, I would very much like to have Torin join me at the podium uh, to receive the acknowledgement of her, uh, certainly her accomplishments thus far. And uh, she will introduce our keynote, keynote speaker, Gail Adams Jackson. Torin. Thank you, Dr. Matera. Uh, I've had the pleasure of spending the day with Gail Adams Jackson, and it has been an absolutely wonderful day. Uh, so Gail Adams Jackson is a native of Shreveport, Louisiana, and has more than 30 years of experience in the communications and governmental relations arena. She's a graduate of LSU and a former news anchor and radio personality. She's currently the director of communications for the International Association of uh, Physio, uh, sorry, Phew. Uh, Geophysical Contractors, headquartered in Houston, Texas. IAGC is the Global Trade Association representing geophysical 
it's, it's a mouthful. Geophysical services companies focusing on the oil industry. Gail joined IAGC after serving three years as President Barack Obama's presidential appointee directing inter intergovernmental and external affairs for the US Department of the Interior. Her responsibilities were to establish and maintain relationships between the Department of the Interior and governors of all 50 states and US territories, state and local officials, and the more than 6,000 6, stakeholders and organizations. Gail also served as the DOI's contact for the tourism industry and its stakeholders. She's a member of the President's Task Force for Tourism and Competitiveness, which developed the nation's national tra travel and tourism strategy. Prior to her appointment, Gail served as the governmental affairs officer for the Macondo oil spill on loan to the Coast Guard from FEMA, where she was intergovernmental affairs director. As the oil spill governmental affairs officer, Gail oversaw uh, intergovernmental inter affairs, congressional affairs, the non-governmental organization interaction un unit, VIP and international visits, as well as some aspects of the community relations for the entire Gulf Coast. She also served as the governmental affairs advisor to the three Coast Guard federa federal on-scene coordinators as a member of their command staff for the response. For her work during the oil spill, Gail received the Coast Guard Distinguished Service Award, the highest non-Coast Guard recognition given to civilians by the Commandant of the Coast Guard. She is the former director of, of the Office of Inter Intergovernmental Affairs, Department of External Affairs for FEMA's Louisiana Tr uh, Transitional Recovery Office. As the IGA director, Gail headed intergovernmental operations for Louisiana for Hurricane Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike. Gail also coordinated all foreign delegation meetings visiting Louisiana to learn lessons of response and recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, G Gail Adams Jackson. I'd like to say good evening to everyone, and I am so honored to be here. I, I tell you, this has been just a, a treat for me. Um, I, I, I am almost speechless with what I've seen here today, and I'd just like to thank um, Dr. Montero to, for inviting me um, and acknowledge two very dear friends who we've walked through a lot, a lot of disasters together, and that's Sayon Quiet Smith, because I knew her before she became a Smith, and then, of course, Mr. Smith, um, Kenya Smith. We um, actually, yeah, Katrina. <laughs> We went through Katrina together, and that's a, a story in and of itself. Um, they were working for the city of New Orleans, and I was working for FEMA. So um, you would think um, at one point in time, since we were on opposite sides of, of the pole, that we couldn't come out of this being friends. But we did. So that's a good thing. And so I'm really, really happy um, to be here. And, and thanks so much to Mr. Pansky. I mean, what a vision. Um, and, and what a man, you know, because he, he's not even an alumni. So you guys really have something special here. And um, I'm I'm just really, really honored to be here, and of course, to our distinguished honoree. Um, she's absolutely fabulous, and I am so glad and, and so honored that you've allowed me to be a part of your life. So thank you, and, and I'm hoping that we have a wonderful friendship for years to come. So let's see if I can do this technical thing, because I'm getting older. See, I have to put on my glasses because I can't see. And <laughs> there are things that I want you guys to know, but, and I wrote it down, but if I can't see it, I can't tell you. So we're going to get started. And this, this button, I think, I hope. Are we ready? Okay. Go back once. One more. Back, back. Back, back. Are you? <laughs> We're going the other way. There we go. Go, go. Okay, there we go. All righty. So, I'm, I must tell you that had it not been for people who um, cared enough about me to make the investment that I would not be before you tonight. I can tell you that. Um, I've had um, a wonderful, wonderful journey with the people who've mentored me. And um, I, when I talk about an invaluable investment, I, I can't even imagine, I can't even stress the word invaluable enough because of people who've imparted in me and they've invested in me. They've actually helped to shape my life and other people's lives because I've been able to impact other people. And so when we think about mentoring, I want you to think about it in, in probably a different way. And I do come 
from, I, I have a different perspective only because of the impact that mentors have made in my life. So this is where my, my mentoring journey started, apart and separate from my parents. And, and like Mr. Pansky, my, my parents were absolutely fabulous mentors. Um, you would never know that my parents never even graduated from high school. I grew up in, in what would be considered probably a lower middle, middle class family. Two parents, I think my dad might have gone to the 10th grade, my mom went to the 9th grade. And so um, the one thing that they did have was that they understood the value of education and they understood the value of young minds. I have one sister and even though my parents never graduated from high school, um, the question in my house was never if I was going to go to college. The discussion was always, where are you going to college? And my parents took um, the time they made financial investments in me. They bought me books. They, my dad had this thing where he bought like all these encyclopedias. And of course, you guys wouldn't know anything about that because this is when they were actually printed. And well, you know, they were like, you had these bookshelves and they were, they, books were like everywhere. And so um, my parents had bought these, all of the book, the, the one was called the Book of Knowledge. It was white with blue writing on it. <laughs> and, um, but we had nights where where if my sister and I said we were bored, my dad is like, great, you know, let's get out an encyclopedia, pick a, a topic, and let's debate about it. And so they taught me to be independent-minded. They taught me to think outside of the box and sometimes to go against the grain, but above everything else to be true to myself. And then I had those special people who were my teachers. And I can remember them to this day. It started out with Miss Woodley. She was my first grade teacher. And then my, my fifth grade teacher was Miss Ruthie L. Hooks. And she was known as the mean teacher. Nobody wanted Mrs. Hooks. And then in my middle school years, there was Mrs. Wiggins. And so these people made some really, I mean, really great impressions in my life. And when I talk about investment, they made real investments. All of these teachers, some of them even took me home on the weekends because they saw something in me. And so rather than um, allowing me to become what might have been a statistic, because of course when you're um, a teenager, right, you think you know everything, you think your parents don't know anything, and that's the time that you don't listen to your parents, but it was that at that time that my teacher, Ms. Wiggins, um, began to take me home on the weekends. We talk about what happened in school. Um, I've always been a, a feisty little thing, and so sometimes when I got out of hand at school or whatever, she'd call me in. She said, hey, you, we're not doing this. You're not, you, we're not going to do this, and she kept me focused, and so I think that it's important that we, you know, acknowledge that these people who have made the difference in our lives and then there are bosses. I've actually had bosses who've, who've made investments in me. Um, one of those people, I would say, is, is Secretary Ken Salazar, or former Secretary Ken Salazar. Um, as he was coming through for the oil spill and I was doing all the things that I was doing and trying to manage those things, um, he you know, noticed that I, I worked hard and that I was dedicated and I tried to resolve issues. And he said, you know, gee, I, I really like the way you work. I've got to get you to DC. But I was one of those people who had promised myself that I would never work in DC. I, I, I didn't like working for members of Congress. And so I always avoided that like the plague. And uh, because my passion is really working with state and local government, that's what I love to do. And uh, but so Secretary Salazar said, gee, I'd like to have you as a part of my team. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to DC. I, I, did, I never believed it um, until I got the call. And then they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. Who can refuse working for the President of the United States? That's just awesome, you know? So all of these people have helped to, to make my life more full, not just in, in my career. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then there are the colleagues, such as the people that are sitting in this audience, like um, Kenya and Sayan. There are many days that um, Sayan, we the Starbucks coffee is our thing. So, um, and many problems were solved at the Starbucks, you know, and we were, you know, and, and not just talking about the issues and things, but I, I looked at the way she handled, you know, issues on that. At that time, I was intergovernmental affairs director. I wasn't in communications. She was a communications director, you know, but I, I looked at the way she worked, you know, and the way that she did things and the way that she communicated and the way that she tried to resolve issues. And so I took, you know, took pointers from that. And we can learn from anybody. And you're never too old to learn. And then we have our subordinates. And I, I have to take time to, and I have to acknowledge this one very special person in my life. And um, so when I got to the Department of the Interior, there, there was this lovely woman who um, was my um, secretary. And her name is DeAndrea Jackson. 
not kin to me. Um, but DeAndrea became one of my best mentors. And as you are going through your journey, your, your career journey, I don't ever want you to forget that everybody in your life can bring value. And you can learn something from anybody in your life. And even though she was, quote, in her mind when we first got started together, I was, she was just my secretary. She became more than that. She became my mentor. Why? Because she had worked at the Department of the Interior for 27 years. I had only been, I had just gotten there. Um, she was a career person and she had seen many a political appointee come and go. So she had a lot to teach me and I wanted to learn and she helped me to become very successful. I was able to do a lot of different things um, for the department in the area of intergovernmental affairs and external affairs working along with our communications department that had not been done at Interior before. And the only reason I was able to do that is because I allowed that person to really invest in me, even though she was my subordinate. And so, you know, a lot of times, especially if you um, are in certain positions, you can really get caught up and, 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 and hooked on titles. And you can get hooked on positions. But no matter what your title is, no matter what your position is, just remember that everybody has something that they can bring to your life if you're open to receive it. But you have to be open to receive it. And if you're closed because you're hung up on things that most of the time really don't matter, you're going to miss some really valuable experiences and some really key relationships with some really great people. And then there are people that are outside of your organization that can also mentor you to help you in your career path. Um, and when I was at Interior, I really needed that because I went from being um, a, a career person with FEMA to being a political appointee with Interior, and I didn't know what all of that stuff was about because when they called and said, you know, do you have a problem with being, um, with an appointment, I didn't even know what an appointment was. I, I can be honest now, I said no. And I had to go back and I asked someone, what, what in the world is an appointment? I have no idea. I just told these people I don't have a problem with an appointment. I don't know what that is. But um, I, there were some key people like Steve Richer with the National Tour Association. There was Derek Crandall, um, who was with the National Parks Association, that really helped me and helped me to um, formulate the, my path um, at Interior. And so again, as you're going through your own personal journey, um, just don't forget that so many people can really bring value to your life and let them make that investment. So this is my most... Um, important statistic. I'm not big on numbers. <laughs> I'm just not. Um, I'm big on the bottom line. And so for me, the bottom line is this. If you don't remember anything about mentoring, just remember that most people who are mentors were once mentored by somebody. And that's important. You know, it, it is so important that we give back. And it is so important that as people recognize our talents and our gifts and our abilities and they want to make those investments, investments in us, that we remember that we need to make it our job. This is a part of your job to go out and you need to make it a part of your job to go out and spot those people that you can make an investment in as well. So this is a mentor and you've heard Francis talk about that. So uh, the mentor is a person who affects your, pro your professional life. And that, that's very true. You're the protege. And they foster insight, but they also provide insight for you. They identify the, what you need in terms of knowledge. Because a lot of times the things that we think we know, we don't always know. And we need people who can stand outside of us and be objective and help us. Um, they help us to grow. Um, and the assistance that you normally get, particularly in a work situation, supplements, if you have a supervisor, it supplements what your supervisor should be doing. And I say should. Um, traditionally, the mentoring relationships, this relationship consists of an experienced executive providing guidance and advice to an associate with less experience. Again, my take on that is a little bit different <laughs> because people have all kinds of experiences. And you need to draw from all of them so you can be very well-rounded because that's what it's about. The most successful um, executives, the most successful people in their careers are very balanced and well-rounded people who understand that if you're out of balance, there's something wrong. That's, that's not a good thing. You can have too much of something or not enough of, of, of other things. So I think in terms of the, when you think about experience, again, my, my secretary had much more experience at this thing than I did. I had Vicki Dixon, who was my program analyst at Interior. She had been there for 30 years. 
think about it. What did I really know coming into a new situation? And so I needed those people, even though I was, quote, the executive. So again, just think about the value of what you can get from all the people around you and look for mentors everywhere that you can find them because they're important. So what is a mentor? They provide you with the tools that you need to be successful. And I, I, for me, I, it's very important because I say as you define success. And I was sharing with Torin <laughs> this morning that I had a, a very real life example of that because I, I've probably mentored some 30 people in my 30 years uh, in, in my career. And so I have two sons, Adam and Christian, they're 25 and 23. And I have to throw in a shameless plug, I'm also a grandmother, I have a two year old grandson. So, <laughs> Kayla. So, um, the thing that, that I struggled with the most because I preach this all the time and all of the people that I've mentored, I've always told them, you know, it's important that you define what your definition of success is because often the people around you, we're, we may sometimes lean toward helping you to define what success means to you and it's important that you gain success on your own terms. And so my real life um, practical applications that I've had to um, work with are my own two children. Uh, my son, Adam, who's 25, he had, has one year left um, before he'll have his finance degree from LSU. So a couple of years ago, he comes to me, and it's going into the last year, and he says, Mom, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, let's go back. Let's talk about this. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I really like working with my hands, and I really want to do something different. I really want to work with cars. And I'm like, son, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know. And he tells me he wants to go to this school to learn auto body mechanic stuff. So I have to remember that. But he wants to use my money to do it. So we were pretty good until we got to my money part, right? Because I had spent all this money for LSU for him to go to school. So I was not happy. I was really, really, really not happy. I was like total in, totally in parent mode. And so um, I told him, I said, well, I, I don't think you should do that. I think you should really go and get that last year. He said, but mom, I just won't be happy. And so I said, well, let me think about it and I'll get back with you. And, and one thing that happened is over the course of time when I was thinking about it, it took me about a week because I had to adjust myself. I really did. Um, but what came to mind and what I was reminded of was that it was almost like I was having a, a conversation with myself. It was like, you know, you've always had the opportunity to do what you love. You've, you've done television, you've done radio, you've done print, you've worked for the president, you've done all of these great things that you consider great in your life. Doesn't your son deserve the same thing? Doesn't he deserve to do the thing that makes him happy? And don't you preach this to all of your, men, your mentees and your protégés? And so then, of course, I had to go back and I had to correct that. And I told him, I said, you know what, you're right. You're, you, if you want to do this, then you should do it. And you should do what makes you happy because if you do what you like, you'll be really good at it and you'll make money and all that other stuff. So he did, he completed his, his coursework and everything. He ended up being the vice president of the class. Um, his second year, he got a scholarship. So all he had to pay for one year, he's gone to two national competitions. The first year he was ranked in the top 15. The last year he was ranked in the top 10 in the country for what he does. And, and he's making money. Let me tell you, I didn't know that people actually spent money to do things to their cars. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I, I, I had no idea. I buy a car, I drive the car, I don't do anything different to the car. But there are people, <laughs> there are people who actually do other things to their cars after they buy them. I mean, it blew my mind. So he's making like all this really great money. I was like, son, who, who would have thought? Who knew that? You know, so it, it was a really great experience for me because I just had no idea. But I was, you know, and I've always prided myself on being a great mentor to my sons. But when, but I had to um, go back and, and kind of remember this and, and, and live by what I preached to other people. So, but it was a great lesson for me, a really great lesson. And then my younger son, he's in Los Angeles being an actor slash model slash doing all that other good stuff. But these are things that were very different for me, for me because I've come, you know, my idea about life is so different. But I've had to mentor them through a lot of things as well and give them the same support that my parents have given me. 
So um, a mentor counsels you, discusses things, and, and coaches you and advises you like you've heard before. And they do that in a safe environment. And, and, I, and I talk about the safe environment because over um, the course of the years that I've mentored young people particularly, um, there have been times that where I've seen other mentors um, I think the relationship needs to be a, a really close relationship with a mentor where people feel that they can share whatever and not be judged. So when I talk about a safe environment, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days as, as the protege or, or the mentee, um, but you should feel safe to be able to talk about the issues and the things that you're really going through um, with your mentor. Because if you're honest and you put the things out there, you'll be surprised that, you know, how they can help you. And so don't, um, you know, a lot of times we like to pretend like we know it all already, or if we don't know something, we like to act like we know them. Don't do that because you're cutting yourself short and, and you're not allowing that mentor to really be to you what you need them to be. And that's to be a true guide and, and a counselor. So all of this stuff, I'm not reading them. You guys know how to read. But the one thing that I, I, I wanted to point out is that if, when you're looking for a mentor, find someone who's actually passionate about mentoring. You know, you can be in certain work environments where people, you've been, a person has been assigned to another person. And I can tell you that's not a good feeling because I've been in that position. Well, I, this person, I'm going, you know, Gail's been assigned to you and they're like, okay, let's go and do this. <laughs> not good, right? Who wants that? And, and what can you really get from that, right? And so make sure that when you are looking for a mentor, make sure that you find a good one, someone who's passionate about being a mentor, someone who's, who's excited about the opportunity. Because it's not just an opportunity for you. It's also an opportunity for the person who's doing the mentoring. I can't tell you every time I've mentored someone, I have grown and I've become a bigger person and I've learned more and I've learned so much. Just in, in the conversations that Torin and I have had today and in some of the presentations that I've seen from some of you guys who are in the audience tonight, what I've learned. And I, I, I want to take that and I want to add that to who I am so I can become a bigger and a better person and do more and experience more and experience what I've already, you know, experience new things in a different way. And so it's so important, you know, that you find someone who's good at it, who likes to do it, who wants to do it, and who's willing to share what they know. And a lot of times people are very guarded about what they know. They won't share with you what they know. And what I always encourage people to, to, to remember and to understand about mentoring and about sharing what you know, that is one of the very few things that you can keep giving away and still keep it, is what you know. No one can ever take that away from you and no matter how much you share it, guess what? You still know it and it's still yours. So you don't have to be guarded. You don't have to feel like, oh, I can't share this with them because they'll take it and then they'll surpass me. I want everybody in this room to be better than me. I want you to go on and do things that I only dreamed about. That's how I know I'm successful. I'm doing really, really good if the people that I've mentored are doing better than I am. That is my measure of success. And so I want you guys to really think about that because when you're, you're gone, what you've done to impact other people's lives is the only thing that you have. Think about if Mr. Pansky's story about his mom had been different. That's what he's left with and what, and what she left him with. And that's something that he can keep giving and giving long after he's gone. What he's established here will go on as long as the people who follow him continue to do it. And that's, a one, that's the wonderful thing about imparting to others and making that investment into other people. And it doesn't make you less, it makes you more, it makes you better, all of that. And so there's never a reason for people to be guarded with what they know. And the last thing I wanted to point out is a mentor will teach you what you don't learn in school. Pop, contrary to popular belief, you're not gonna learn everything that you need to know about out there in school. And mentors are the people who share with you and they open up that door and they let you take a peek into the real world. And they help you navigate that. They help you navigate, um, and I think you're gonna see this too, they help you navigate the pitfalls. Um, I was a political appointee. You don't think that there was a lot, lot of politics going on <laughs> at Interior, right? And so I had to have those mentors in place to help me navigate that and, and not um, step into mines and, and not step into potholes and all those kinds of things. And so there are gonna be things that you don't learn in school 
but make sure that you get a mentor who's willing to share with you and help you to learn those things that you need to know. So for me, you know, mentoring is not just, you know, a person who comes in and shares information with you, um, but it's a person who has a trust relationship with you. Where that and, and that person, they trust their own experiences because that's another part of being a mentor. We all have valuable experiences that we can bring to the table to help other people navigate their careers and navigate their lives. And so you have to trust your own experiences. And even though I was the mentor for the day for Torrin, I mean, she has done so much. I mean, you heard the, the resume, you've heard all the things that she's done. So she has enough experiences right now in her life to go out and mentor other people and to help make them better. And each of you sitting in these chairs tonight, you have enough to go out and to help other people. You have enough to help young people, kids in high school, kids in middle school, kids in elementary school. So don't think that you have to get to a certain level before you can reach back and you can help other people. You have what you need right now. You need to use it and make sure that you find somebody. I mean, there are, all, there are so many people out there who are looking for direction and looking to matter to somebody. And so you all are in positions now. There are kids who, I mean, because I, I have to be honest with you, going to college, coming from a family that never went to college, that's, that's huge. And I did not have a mentor to help me get in college and to help me understand everything there was about college. I had to do it by trial and error, you know, and had I had someone who was in college to help me, just think about how much better I could have been. You know, and so there are going to be young people who, without you, won't be able to see the vision of college. But if you don't do anything and you don't reach out to them and you don't mentor them, they won't ever see the vision. Mr. Pansky was talking about the fact that um, in this business that there are very few people of color. Well, who can do something about that? We're the people who can do something about that. What are you doing about that? Is that important to you? If it's not important to you, it needs to be important to you. Our world is only better when we have people from all backgrounds bringing what they have to the table to make a whole picture. That's what this thing is about. And so if everybody looks like you, acts like you, comes from where you come from, what is the new thing that's going to come to the table? What's the new evolution? Um, how can we stop resolve issues and problems that are longstanding within our communities and our country um, if we keep doing the same thing? And we know the definition of insanity, right? And so it's so important, you know, that we think about mentoring and we think about it in a way that's really practical. I'm very practical, um, you know, and I, I think about, you know, it's about at the everyday walk, it's about everyday life. And so it's not just about your career because the other thing that I believe about mentoring is the things that you learn for your career, you can apply them to your life. There's, you know, I don't, you know, because I'm standing here, I haven't stopped being Adam and Christian's mother. I haven't stopped being Martha and Leroy's daughter. I haven't stopped being Daniel's wife. I'm still all of those things. And so all of the skills that people have, that I've learned from people and that people have taught me over the years, I take them and I apply them to all parts of my life to make me success, successful in all aspects of my life. We're multifaceted people. And so the skills that we learn on our job can be applied other places. The things that we learn at home can be applied on the job. And so my thing when it comes to mentoring is that we don't take it and we don't just kind of you know, box it off and have it over here. Well, this is, you know, my work life and this is my home life. And, and, and you should have some separation. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying the things that you learn in one can be applied to the other. If you, and that's what the way I work with my mentors. I mean, my mentees, if I can teach them how to look at an issue or resolve a problem, they can take that same principle and apply it to other parts of their life and apply it to other jobs. And so it's just really important that we think about it in, in, a, in a very different manner where it's really practical. So you heard me do all of this talking about all this good stuff. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to two of, of, the, of the protégés, the people that I've worked with. And I, um, you're going to see two different perspectives. Um, the first young man is a, a, a young man that I met at the Department of the Interior who decided to adopt me. Why? I don't know. Um, but um, I became his mentor. 
And um, he did not work in my department or anything. Actually, he was in the training department, and I was actually doing something very, very different. And then the second young man that you're going to meet um, is an actual person who worked for me. He was one of my employees when I worked at FEMA. And the wonderful thing about both of these gentlemen is that they've gone on to be incredibly successful in, in, in you know, a lot of areas of their lives, but I still maintain my relationships with them. I've been gone from FEMA for, oh my goodness, I think since 2011. Um, so I've been gone a really long time, but I maintain relationships with, it, with um, Leon, and I still talk to um, Alex all the time. Alex, I, I feel like he's one of my children um, because he's gone on to do some really incredible things, and I think he's only like 27 years old. So, I mean, he's just really doing really, really, no, 24. He's doing some really great things. So I think now you guys are going to take over back there with the video. Do I need to do anything else? So that's Alex. Hello, my name is Alex Trumbull. I'm the founder and CEO of GPS Leadership Solutions. I'm also the author of the best-selling ebook, The GPS Guide to Success. Over the last few years, I've done some really cool things at a really young age. At the age of 24, I created an executive leadership development program for a federal agency. I was the youngest in my class to do that. I managed three government-wide leadership development forums two in Washington, D.C., and one in Denver. I was invited to the 2013 White House Youth Summit based on my work with helping young professionals be successful and achieve their goals. And most recently, I started my own organization and became an author. Now, though this took a lot of hard work and a lot of time to get to where I've gotten, I could not have done it, not by any stretch of the imagination, without my mentors. I'm someone who truly believes in mentors, having multiple mentors, in fact, having mentors to help you identify the skills and grow those skills and competencies you need to be successful, having mentors to sometimes kick you in the butt, be accountable to, and let you know when you're doing wrong and when you need to get back on the right track. And then there's mentors like Gail Adams, who are holistic mentors, not only helping you as an employee, navigate the political potholes of an organization or develop those skills that you need to become successful, but helping you simply become a better person. Gail, through her mentoring, even though she's left our organization, has allowed me to look into her life and see where the mistakes that she had made and where I could do better. She's been looking out for me as a true mentor, someone who was a confidant and never judged me based on any question I've asked her. When people ask me about mentoring, the number one question I always get is, well, how do you ask someone to be your mentor? And my answer is typically, I don't. A mentor is really just someone you have a relationship with, someone who you can go and trust to have conversation with who's not going to use the information you give them against you. There are many mentors I have who simply started off with me just asking them questions all the time and going to them and asking their opinion or what they would do or what they have done. And over the years, I just ended up calling them a mentor and then they ended up calling me a mentee. So don't, don't be held down on the title of having a mentor slash a mentee. It's really about the relationships. The last thing I'll leave you on is my book, The GPS Guide to Success has a lot of great tools that a lot of young people from around the world have found to be extremely valuable. I encourage you to take a look. It's really easy to read. It takes about three hours to get it done, and you'll become, take the first steps on your path to being successful. Thank you again for listening to this, and thank you again, Gail, for being a wonderful mentor. Thank you. So that's Alex. And um, this is his book, and I am so proud of him. It's, it's like he's my own kid. And um, this particular book, I actually helped, I walked 
through the process with him as he was collecting the information from, from young people, all young executives and young career people all over the world. And it's just a really great book. And what I did was, um, it's available on Amazon. I download, I bought it. I bought several copies of the book and I sent them to my children. I sent them to my other mentees um, and, and my intern who works in the office with me now. So I just had to brag on him just a little bit because it's like a, a proud mama. So. <laughs> <laughs> so next, well, you're going to hear from, from Leon Tarver. And I have to tell you the story about this double stuff afterwards. My name is Leon Tarver III, and I have had the pleasure of having Gail as a supervisor as well as a mentor. When Gail hired me a few years ago, I was like a deer caught in the headlights. I had just relocated from another city. I'm working with new people. I often doubted myself at times. Gail could have easily assigned me to work with another colleague, but she took the responsibility upon herself. Every day she sat with me to ensure that I had the tools necessary to be an effective and efficient communicator, both internally and to our external customers, a very vital role of our job. She also taught me how to analyze problems and offer solutions. One of the biggest takeaways that I learned from Gail was that she taught me how to think outside the box. Without it, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. She has done so much. He's good at stuff, but he's not good at this. A lot of questions. Probably more questions than I probably thought I should have, but I did it anyway because I wanted to learn. I wanted to know. I wanted to do my job the best way that I could. And for that, I will always value everything that I have learned from Gail. It wasn't until when she left is when I was able to apply everything that I learned from her because she wasn't there to, to guide me. But I did it to the best of my ability, and I was pretty good at it. I can only hope at time that I may too be a mentor to a mentee and have that relationship because that's what it's about, fostering a relationship. I'm forever grateful for everything that I've learned through Gail, and I can only hope through all my future employers <laughs> that everyone can be a Gail Adams. Thank you. So that's Leon and, and, and Alex. I have to tell you the story. So I, I told Leon to send me the, the video, right? He sent it to me in like seven different parts, and then my IT guy couldn't put it together, so that's why it's the double stuff. So anyway, he has great skills, but that's not one of them. So um, the, the thing that Leon is doing now, he um, after I left Interior, he um, after I left FEMA, he um, stayed on for a while and um, actually became one of the leads, um, and he took over the city of New Orleans for me when I left. Um, and now he's currently working at the state of Louisiana's um, Governor of uh, Office of um, Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. And so they're wrapping up all of the stuff from all of the hurricanes from Louisiana. So he's working on that and he's doing really, really well. So I'm, I'm really proud of, of both he and Alex. They're really great guys. So here are the takeaways. And I told you I'm, I'm really practical and simple. Mentors are always needed, whether it's in academia, in the workplace, or in life. Make sure you have one or some. It's important. You're going to need them. Find a good mentor. And remember, it does not have to be a formal, in, in, a formal engagement. You don't have to you know, do the paperwork and all that other good stuff. They're wonderful mentoring programs, and so don't, don't think I'm not, I'm not dis, dissing them or anything, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you're not going to have the formal arrangement, you can still have a mentor and a, and a, men, a mentor-mentee relationship. So it doesn't always have to be formal. And you can always hijack someone the way Alex suggested. <laughs> Once you've benefited from having a mentor, pay it forward and invest in someone else. That's how we keep it going. And remember to repay your mentor. So what's the best way to do that? Give them a reason to brag, like me. Okay. Thank you all so much. in the audience, you know, people just getting involved in journalism, and how, how do you really find that person? I, I think 
um, what you should do is, I, I'm always a person, I believe in observing, and I think you should observe the people around you and to see what qualities and characteristics that they have that you would like um, to develop in yourself. And try to find someone who's not exactly like you because you know this is about filling in the gaps. And so, and, 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 and developing where you need development. And so pay attention to the people around you. Um, again, like I said before, don't get hung up on positions and titles and all that other stuff. Look for the, the value that you need and then form a relationship with that person. Again, you know, like Alex said, you don't have to go and say, oh, gee, can you be my mentor? Um, but you know, you may have some questions and, and go and ask them, do you mind if I talk to you? Well, the way he did me, he said, you know, I've been paying attention to the way that you are and everything. He's like, and I really have some important questions. And if you don't mind, I know you're busy, Ms. Adams, because at the time I wasn't married. He said, so, and I know you're out of town a lot, but when you are here, can I make an appointment with your secretary and maybe just have 20 to 30 minutes of your time when you're uh, around? And I said, sure. And then every time I came back for any extent of time, there was Alex. So there you go. Just observe the people around you, someone that you'd like to emulate. Um, someone who may have skills and talents that you feel that you need to develop and form that relationship with them. And most people are, are really happy um, to be able to, 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 to mentor you and to guide you, um, particularly if they're smart. And if they say no, then you didn't want them anyway. So I've had the pleasure of talking to Gail all day, so I wanted to open up the forum to questions uh, for anything you all may have. <laughs> you guys don't be shy. This is, uh, Mike works there. It goes, don't be shy to ask questions. So, Gail, if you could go back in time and outside of your family, let's talk about when you were in college. Mm -hmm. Who was the mentor you had in college and how did they help you through your process to get into your career? Well, you know, and this is the unfortunate part, I did not have one. And I will tell you that I had a, a really um, challenging time um, because I, I mentioned before my parents had never been to college. And so everything that I had to do to get in college, I had to figure it out um, because my parents couldn't help me. It wasn't that they didn't want to, they just didn't have, you know, they didn't know. And so I, um, I figured it out and I got in some kind of way, got in. But uh, while I was, I started out at, at Louisiana Tech and th there was nobody. Um, my first semester, I will tell you, I, I bombed. I made like a D average. <laughs> my, seriously, my, my first quarter, because we were on the quarter system. Um, because I didn't, there was nobody to tell me what to expect. There was nobody to help shepherd me through the process. And so I really had to learn the hard way. And if there had just been somebody, anybody there to help me, um, I think I could have, you know, started out a, a lot better, um, and I could have probably done a lot better. I, I, I ended up being a really good student. I graduated from LSU in the top 10% of my class, and I made the dean's list a few times, but it was not an easy um, journey for me because I had no, no one, absolutely no one, and that's why it's important that, you know, those of us, we take it for granted, and it's, and, you know, and it, for us it's just, oh, that's just our lives and that's the way we live. But I'm telling you, there are people out there who aspire to be a lot of things, but they, and they don't do it. And it's not because they don't want to, it's just because there's nobody there to show them. And it can be very intimidating. And I can tell you, I was horribly <laughs> intimidated uh, uh, to even think about going to college and trying to take the test and trying to figure out how does this thing work and what's the difference between the ACT, the SAT, you know, when, you know, all of that. And there was just nobody there and I had to figure it out. So that's another reason why um, it's very important to me and why I, I do do everything that I, I, I think that I can do to, to help, you know, young people because, you know, we take it for granted that, you know, that's just life and everybody should know how to get in school. It's not that simple. Not that simple. Could you could you explain the transition you made from being a journalist to public affairs? Sure. So it was an accident. Um, <laughs> like so many things that are going to happen in your lives, and they're going to be total accidents. You can't plan it. Um, 
So um, I started out um, working as a journalist at the NBC affiliate WVLA-TV in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A lot of times when you're on television, people assume that you know how to do other things that you really don't know how to do. And so they ask you to do things that you don't know how to do, but you don't tell them that you don't know how to do them. You figure it out and you do those things. So um, because I was uh, doing the work um, as I was an anchor, a morning um, anchor and a reporter for WVLA, um, I stumbled into governmental affairs because um, I was somewhere and I forgot this guy said, you know, would you come and do some voiceovers for some, um, cam some um, campaign commercials? And so I started doing voiceovers um, for local campaigns for um, judge races in, in Louisiana, and you can run for judge and everything. So judges and councils and all that stuff like that. And from there, um, one of the council members who um, had won asked me to come to a meeting and to kind of help plan um, their, in Louisiana, our, their, some of our council members or commissioners are called, they're, they're called police jurors. It's only Louisiana, but anyway, so, um, <laughs> so he asked me to help put together one of the police juror meetings, and from there, I just, it, it was just, it became a passion of mine, and I just, I love state and local government, and from there, I joined a, a, a firm called BCI, um, and they did um, governmental relations, public relations, and, and then I did my own corporate training um, stuff on the side. So that's how I, I stumbled into it and, and loved it and just started doing it. And I don't know how I got back to pure communications, but I, that was, I stumbled into that too. So <laughs> thank you for the question. What is one little known fact about public relations? Well, I'll say this. I, I think in terms of you can learn all the, te the technical stuff, um, but there are some things, um, you know, and you can teach the technical things, but I think one of the keys, uh, at least for me, has been my communications background, just in pure communications, because I did, I, my major was in communications and not public relations. But um, I think one of the key factors um, for success is really knowing how to work with people. You know, because you, you can do your, the, you know, the, the social media stuff, that's a part of it, the advertising stuff, that's a part of it. But I think if you know how to work with people, um, that's, that's the most important thing. And a lot of times we get caught up in the, um, the technical stuff and, and the execution of technical things, and then we forget, you know, the end user is really a, a people and that we need to know how to work with people. You spoke earlier on how you said that you got D average your first quarter of college. What really changed for you to make to improve your academic performance? Um, I, I went to my counselor and I just, you know, because I had never, ever in my lifetime made a D, ever. And in my household, when you made a C, my father, you know, he's like, oh my God, how did you do that? You know, I'm like, like this. You know, but his, his thing is, it's about effort. You make an effort. And so I, I remembered that. And so I went to my counselor and I said, I, I don't get it. I don't understand I don't know why I, this, this is happening to me. And, you know, a, again, just the whole process was so intimidating to me and, and trying to get in. And I will tell you, I think a part of it was, um, again, and this is why it's important to have mentors, the semester, well, the quarter that I entered into college at Louisiana Tech was the same quarter that my father was laid off of his job. And so I was terrified and I thought, you know, where now, where am I going to get the money to go to school because, you know, my grant is only so this much, you know, and I didn't know, you know, a whole lot about trying to get a loan and, and things of that nature. So I had a lot of other stresses and pressures um, in terms of finding the money to go to school. And so I went to my counselor and I told her, I think I'm going to have to quit. Hey, I, I, I failed. Um, you know, and I just, I felt like a complete failure. And thank God for parents who, who are, <laughs> who were very encouraging, you know, and even though my dad had been, you know, he had always been very critical about grades and stuff, he encouraged me to stay in school. And he said, you, you know, just buckle down and, and, and you know, find people who can help you. So I did go to the counselor, um, kind of ironed out how do I get through this money thing because that was huge. And um, they gave me, um, I actually got a, a, a work study. I got on the work study program so I could make sure that I had some funding um, to continue 
continue to go to school because I felt really bad. I'm like, I can't, you know, ask my dad and my mom to pay for school and he just lost his job, you know, and everything. So I think that helped me and because of that, I was even more determined to succeed. I'm like, I'm not gonna let my parents down. I'm not gonna let myself down. I was the first person in my family to ever go to college because none of my, my father's you know, siblings had gone to college, none of my mom's siblings had gone to college, and I just really wanted to make them proud. And even now, uh, most of what I do is just really kind of motivated by you know, what my parents went through and the fact that they, they struggled a lot and they you know, gave up a lot to make sure that my sister and I had better lives. And so um, for me, that was like really big. Can you talk about like the push and pull of professionalism and motherhood and how you deal with being a woman in such a high traffic and demanding field? Yes. Well, I'm going to talk about the woman stuff first. Um, <laughs> it is very difficult. I mean, even though there are, you know, probably mo the majority of the people sitting in this audience are women, it, it, in, a, in a great sense, it, this is still very much a man's world. Period, you know, because when you get to a certain level, the only thing that you see are men. Um, and I don't know what that's about. And, and it, it, is, it's, um, it, it can be very challenging and very frustrating, particularly. And I will tell you right now, um, I really have it because I'm working in upstream oil and gas, um, an international association. And in the, in the industry itself, there are just not a lot of women in the industry. And then when you look at the upper echelons of you know, the various companies and everything, there are even fewer women. And then when you look at it again, because I'm an African-American woman, I just came from an, our international forum of 200 people. Of the 200 people, two of us were African-American. One was a male, one was a female. Everybody else, <laughs> you know. And, and it's just, um, I, I wish I had the answer to that. I, I don't understand it um, because there are, you know, talented and brilliant and bright people of all hues, you know, both male and female. But you know, after a certain level, you just—it's just like you just don't see the diversity anymore. And, and you know, there's just this ceiling where we just drop off. So I'm not really sure, but I, I think um, women like Torin and you um, can continue to advance the cause because I, I think it's important because again, we need that diversity to make us better. And um, you know, a, a, a lot of things, I think you guys may have seen where you know, the president was uh, taking executive action in terms of fair wages and everything. So I think all of that has a lot to do with it. But you know, that's where it's really helpful to keep people in mind like Enid Pansky and not let her dream die. And, and to keep pushing on. I mean, you're, there are always gonna be challenges, and that's okay, challenges make us better. If we don't allow them to break us, they make us better. In terms of being a mom, um, I, the good thing about it for me was that um, I was in, I did news when my children were young, and um, it, didn't, it, it didn't take all of my time. I will tell you the job that I had at, at the Department of the Interior, there's no way I could have had smaller kids and did that job. I literally worked almost around the clock seven days a week. And so um, I think as women and mothers, you know, there is a trade-off. And you have to get that balance, and, and sometimes you do have to put off some things, you know, as you're rearing, especially if you have a young family. I couldn't have done that job because literally I would take vacation time off at Interior to go home to spend time with my mom and my now adult children, and I would literally spend about 45 to 50 percent of my time that I've taken off um, on conference calls, and it never failed. A governor was upset during Christmas, or a mayor was mad at Thanksgiving. You know, it's just, it was always something, and I'm like, I took time off to spend with my family, but I mean, the, you, I, I had to do that because that was a part of, that's what I signed up for when I agreed to become a political appointee. And so you're basically, if, if there is a challenge, you have to answer the challenge when it comes. But I, I would have never accepted that job um, if Adam and Christian had been younger. Couldn't have done it. Thank you very much for uh, your wonderful comments, your presentation, and uh, a wonderful evening. Uh, now, of course, it's gift-giving time, as well as uh, photo opportunities for our Aspire Award. But we're going to start with the gifts first. 
because um, there is a story behind the gifts. And you actually have to open the box to be able to understand the story. Okay. <laughs> okay. And Mr. Yeah, Scott Pansky, would you come up here as well? Well, let me just tell you a little bit about what Gail was opening up. And it is a Solari bell. And it is an artisan bell made by Paolo Solari. Yes. They really, they really wrapped it this time. Uh, the reason why this is important for you to know what this is, it's handcrafted. It's uniquely Arizonan. And we gave the first bell to Dr. Glenn Broom. Who is familiar with Dr. Glenn Broom's famous saying about bells? Anyone? His statement is, you have to be very careful about the messages that you send and the words you say, because you cannot unring a bell. And so we felt that that was so appropriate. He was Scott's academic mentor. And we wanted to create that connection through all of the mentors and, of course, the original who started it all, Mr. Pansky, who has his own bell. And by some weird chance, I swear to you, I did not do this on purpose. They made it this way. It actually has a trident on the side of it that looks just like Sparky's fork. So I felt that we had, of course, to do this. Uh, so we give that uh, to Gail, and she is forevermore connected now with Glenn Broom, Scott Pansky, and those mentors in the future. So when you ring that bell, make sure it's for the right reason. OK? All right. Come on. Two other gifts, one for Samantha, Sam Pansky, to remember us by at the Cronkite School, and we hope that you will wear some in good health, use some in good health, and return to the campus to use them here. And for Mr. Lewis Pansky, we have a little something for you too, a lovely parting gift, as it were, because we want you to feel comfortable in Arizona and as an ASU Sun Devil. Certainly, we had to give you a hat to keep the sun off your brow <laughs> and a water bottle to keep you hydrated when you climb you know, Camelback. I know you're going to do that one of these days, probably with Sam and, of course, your wonderful son, Scott. And so we want to make sure that you remember us and that you return to the valley. And lastly, I will ask our mentor from 2014. to present this award. It's the 2014 Aspire Award to Torin and Sinclair. And we thank them both for being the wonderful uh, people that we wish to emulate in our futures. Thank you. Thank you all, and you're welcome to come up and congratulate our guests this evening. Thank you, and we'll see you next year.